I'm Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. I'm here with Joel Green. And today we're going to talk about leadless pacemakers. So, so Joel, yeah. we talk about permanent or emergent pacemakers. Uh, these are permanent and emergent, both oh, cases. They do yeah. go both, okay. Um, there is some research out there that they can be retrieved, so I'm curious. Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay, so set us up. Okay, so should we talk about emergent pacing quick? Yeah, so okay. I mean, the, right now, I mean, why do we pace in general? I mean, oh like, yeah, so symptomatic patient, bradycardia is exactly. bottom line. Yeah. So patient for some reason oh. is not getting enough perfusion to get okay. going. So they need a faster rate to compensate, yeah. so we use a pacer. Yeah, and you know, one of the questions I always get from nurses is, where do you set the rate? Well, you guys, it's simple as this. Here's the equation, you guys ready? Cardiac output is what times what? It's heart rate times and stroke, stroke volume. volume. Yeah. What can you manipulate here? Heart rate. And so if you've got a patient with a pressure of the toilet, put the heart rate Increase faster. Rate, exactly, I mean, it's, yeah. it's really, there's no magic to it. But like, let's say I've got something with a pressure of like 60 over palp, it's like set them at 80 or 100. Yeah. Whereas if they're just kind of borderline, I don't know, like 60 might be fine, right? Or maybe they just need yeah. a backup rate. Or maybe, yeah. yeah, exactly, a backup rate. Like, I mean, because the thing is, if, if we can avoid pacing, we right. should, right? You know, uh, you pacing, temporary pacing should really only be used for emergencies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for pacing, right now we have three types of pacing. You have transcutaneous, okay. um, you have transvenous. Yep. Patches, transvenous. Okay. And then we have permanent pacers. We also have epicardial though. Yeah, and I always kind of lump epicardial in with transvenous because the mm -hmm. concepts are very similar. Yeah. The only advantages with epicardials, those of you that are cardiac surgery, yeah. uh, is you get sometimes you get atrial, atrial wires, wires if your surgeons yeah. give you what you want. Um, and uh -huh. so why are atrial wires so important? Well, you can A-pace patients, right. you know, stuff they kind of lose why that. Why is A-pacing important? Well, it just, it kind of can be this, stimulate the SA, a, a V node to kind of take over as pace maker of the heart. Because I don't want to wait until I'm all the way down to the right. ventricles to, you know, get a big desynchronous uh, depolarization, you know, if I can stimulate the atria and do just fine. And the other important thing is the atrial kick. I mean, yeah, if you are absolutely. just ventricular pacing, you lose that atrial kick, which is about 25% of their cardiac output. Yeah, which is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. So if you're already talking about somebody who's hypoperfused or, yeah. you know, hypotensive and those kind of things, 25% makes a big difference a big in those difference. patients. So yeah, atrial absolutely. is awesome. Uh, so when you have atrial wires, yay, but you're not always gonna get them. So. No, and really the only way to atrial pace emergently mm. truly is with epicardial, epicardial wires. Yeah. I mean, I know people have put a transvenous wire in the atria, but it, there's yeah. there's nowhere to secure it. It doesn't really, it's 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 very iffy at it's best. It's messy, yeah. yeah. it's iffy at best, okay. All right, so you want to talk about leadless yeah, pacers. Yeah, so leadless pacers, uh, these came out, they started coming to market a couple years ago, okay. um, but there wasn't a lot of info about them. A lot of people were like, well, what are these little things? Oh. Um, you equate them to about the size of a Tic Tac, okay. um, so they're small, All right. um, and they are placed in the right ventricle just like a transvenous wire is. Okay. Okay. Um, so either cath lab or IR, um, preferably those, whereas transvenous, you can do it at the bedside. Um, we always push cardiology to like do it up, down in the lab, yeah, but, can, but um, these have to be done in the lab. Okay. Um, and so what they do is they just implant this little tic-tac right into the right ventricle, um, and then it is in VVIR mode. So okay. going over your pacer modes again, Let's do it. each letter makes us something different. So your first letter is what chamber is that pacing? So, so V is ventricle. ventricle. All right. So we're pacing the ventricle. Mm -hmm. uh, the second V is which chamber you're sensing. So we're okay. sensing the ventricle. Sensor, sensing the ventricle as well. Okay. Uh, your third chamber is what are you are inhibiting. So in this case, we're or sent or. Well, the way I always say yeah. it is, is how do you want the pacemaker yeah. to respond if it sees an intrinsic B? Yeah. So in we this case, we want it to inhibit. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's in VVI. And then the R is really important. This is your rate adaptive yeah, phase. Huge. So if you don't have rate adaptive, this thing's just going to pace at 60 or it's just going to pace at 80. But let's say the patient does want to lose weight this February. And so now we're talking yeah. more permanent pacers, right? The leadless actually have VVIR in them. So Even they, emergent? Yes. These huh. little guys are pretty smart. Because you can't do a kind of a rate responsive With pacing. With transvenous, yeah. Or transcutaneous or right. any other type of emergent pacing. Okay. Yeah, so only with the permanent pacer or with these do they have the rate adaptive, which is really cool. Yeah. So rate adaptive, basically, they sense an increased metabolic demand, and then the patient can go upstairs, they can do their orange theory, they can do their P90X, um, or they can just do their... 
daily activities. I use of, Peloton. I got I'm going to go out and walk Bailey for five minutes and not, yeah. get, to, not get out of breath. Yeah. So um, that's what the, v, the R stands for. Yeah, because can you imagine if you were completely, we're talking permanent pacers yeah. now, if you were completely pacer dependent and your pacer only paced at 80, right. like, you could never do anything, right? Um, go hiking or do any, you or know. Or just lay down to take a nap because then yeah. your heart's still it's beating super nap. fast, yeah. but you're wanting yeah. to lay down. So yeah, the rate adaptive is a very it's important huge, feature up there. Huge, yeah. And those have been around for a number yeah. of years. I mean, a couple decades, mm -hmm. but but it's the whole leadless yeah. to have function. that function in this little guy is pretty important. That's so different. Um, so yeah, with these, again, like we talked about, remember it's a ventricular pacer, so you're going to yeah. lose that 25% of cardiac output. So these are not patients that, most of these patients are just symptomatic bradycardia, where their okay. intrinsic rhythm may be there 90% of the time, but once in a while they dip down lower. Oh, okay. um, or they have a third degree, but the third degree is at a fast enough rate that they can manage activity like their blood pressure may be normal even though they have third degree okay. it's not going to be for a completely asystolic patient or someone who's in really advanced heart failure that's going to need that biventricular or that dual chamber pacing yeah that's how you know we will definitely do a uh, a video on biventricular cardiac resynchronization yeah. therapy for sure later this year but okay so this is interesting so so basically it's still they're only putting this little lead or lead list, the little tic tac, -tac yeah. type uh, little sensor in the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to pace both ventricles. Correct. Yeah. Only so it's right. only a right ventricular pacer. Okay. Yeah. And then, so if you were to like have a patient with this, what would their QRS look like? It'd be... So it's going to be, oh, they're going to have the right bundle branch block. They're going to be that wide complex because okay, you're going to start yeah. at the right and go over to the left. So they're going to have yeah. wide complex yeah. um, QRS. And does that make sense for a lot of you? So if you've got a patient who's got like a DDD pacer or a VVI permanent pacer, the QRS is always wide because the lead usually sits in the right ventricle. So what happens is that a little stimulus is is uh, delivered and then the right ventricle starts to depolarize and then the left is like, oh, I guess I should depolarize too. And so that's why you always have a wide QRS because you've got dysynchrony mm -hmm. in the depolarization. Yeah, yeah. okay. Any, what, like, what would be some advantages of getting this so the biggest, So there's sure. three big advantages. The okay. first one is infection. Um, so we know with like transvenous, you've got that sheath in the neck or you have a sheath in the groin. And anytime we have a sheath, you're at risk for infection. Okay, so um, now we're talking about temporary yeah. pacers, okay. Yeah, so on the temporary Perfect. side, we're getting rid of that sheath. Um, so these patients, they can get up, they can walk around, they can do their normal day daily activities while they're still in the hospital. Okay. Um, but they're not having these big sheaths that are prone to bleeding, infection, and everything else that okay. we know are problems with sheaths. Okay. Um, from the permanent side, there with the infection, the pacers on average on permanent pacers, the leads have about a 1% infection rate and the pockets have about a 3% infection rate. Okay. So you're eliminating those two infection rates. Okay. So where's the generator? So I'm an, on a permanent yeah. pacer, where's the generator? So these are their own generator. So they oh, are okay. their generator, the pacer, the sensor, the lead, everything all in one little tic-tac. That is insane. Yeah. So if you want to see pictures of it in the blog on Nicole's website, you act, there's actually some links to how they insert these things wow. and also pictures of them. But like I said, they're tiny. Um, the other cool thing is they can retrieve them. Um, so let's say your heart recovers or we're going to put okay. in a full, you know, lead pacer okay. um, or whatever happens, you need to get rid of this thing. Um, they have a docking mechanism on them. So um, the two companies that are out there, um, one uses a magnet and one uses a loop and they can actually okay. pull them out. They say their success rates are pretty good, but yeah, I mean, as I said, they're new, so we still don't know a whole yeah, lot about them. So. so this little tic tac, I'm just, I'm trying yeah. to like picture this in my head. Does it like screw into the myocardial? Ah, uh, good question. Oh. So one brand screws in; it has like a little pigtail that kind of hooks in and okay. screws in. Um, the other brand actually has these little like hooks that go in like an anchor and they come down and loop back through almost oh, like a cross stitch okay um, and then when they hook the docking mechanism they suck back up inside That's fascinating. yeah it's kind okay. of yeah it's kind of like a little leech it just goes in there and hooks to the endocardium fascinating and then did you remember reading like uh is there a chance of perforation yes. or tamponade or anything like that. So although they sound fantastic and everyone's like, well, why would you not put in these cool little pacers if somebody needs a temporary pacer yeah. or a permanent pacer? Um, just like anything else you put in the heart, there is still some infection risk with these little guys. Um, they can dislodge. And okay. where would they go if they dislodge? The lungs? They're going to go right into that pulmonary artery. Yeah. And so basically they become a mechanical pulmonary embolism. 
Um, so TBA, TBA is, is not, not going to work on that. Heparin yeah. not going to work. They actually have to do open heart surgery to remove these things. Uh, um, they can't which just is, go fish it out? No. It, once it goes to the pulmonary artery, it's kind of down the route. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, and then like you said, tamponade. So let's say I corkscrew this in and I go all the way through the endocardium because it's very friable yeah, or my anchor yeah. hooks go all the way through. So tamponade is another thing. Um, so you're going to have to watch for signs and symptoms of tamponade when okay. they're inserted. All right. And then what about perforation? Like, because you know how when you perforate with a transvenous wire, you can actually, you're pacing the diaphragm right. and you're like, Ugh! Very similar, yeah. You can do at that. At the rate as well. of whatever you got yeah. the pacer set at. Yeah. The same thing or no? Same thing, but you would okay. actually have to activate the pacer. So in this oh, case, okay. uh, if the pace when they implant it, it's not on. Okay. So they wouldn't know until they actually turn it on. Got it. Um, and that's one thing they talk about in the two companies is how they um, change the settings on these. Oh. So one uses the body's bioimpedance to help change it, and okay. then the other uses like a Bluetooth connection. So that'll change their battery lives too. Wow. On how much they're changing settings. This sounds absolutely fascinating. So we're going to have more information for you in the notes. And then also go to NicoleCupchickConsulting.com to read Joel's blog all about these leadless pacers. This is really exciting. Yeah. And we hope to continue to bring you cutting edge technology and just ideas and give you um, just kind of an, uh, you know, a path of where technology is going. Yeah, so there's some it's really fun cool stuff. stuff yeah. right? A lot of fun um, stuff. But there's some so. cool insertion videos on their links. Um, so if you want to see those as well, like, okay. you know, when we watch like Tavar videos, it's cool see how it's done. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm Nicole Kupchik and I'm Joel Green. And this is 10 Minute Tidbits.